Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, this is Metin Aitekin. Uh, I am the PR director of ISCA, International Society of Stem Cell Application. And welcome to our webinar series. And uh, we are planning to have webinars at least twice a month with different subjects related to regenerative medicine. Please find more information on our website, www iscalink.org. Actually, I'm going to write the website uh, link on the chat box below. And you can follow us by our website <coughs> and by our special, uh, our social media accounts. And uh, on our website, you can also find our ISCA magazine, which includes many different articles and cases related to regenerative medicine. And today we are going, going to continue to discuss very interesting subject, 3D printing. Uh, if you want to ask any question uh, during the talk, please uh, write your question on the chat box below, as you can see. And today's our speaker guest is Diane Lee, uh, who is a senior bio consultant and project leader in the global business development team at Rocket Healthcare Company. And, uh, he had an excellent education before joining the Rocket Healthcare. Uh, she was a research assistant at MIT, uh, MIT Koch and Institute, which is the one of the best uh, research institute in USA. She also studied biochemistry in USA, and she is uh, joining us from Korea right now and i know that she is really late there so i cannot wait to listen to her and hi Daya, can you hear me Daya? yes hi martin i hi. can hear you very well welcome and thank Hello, you for everyone. accepting our invitation and stage is yours thank you so much thank you martin and thank you to iska for inviting me to speak in this webinar series. My name is Daya Lee and I'm a bi senior bioconsultant at Rocket Healthcare mm -hmm. and pleased to speak from all the way from Korea. Um, let me share my screen without further ado and start the presentation. Okay. Can you all see well? Yes. Okay, great. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, to introduce myself once again a little bit, I'm a senior bioconsultant at Rocket Healthcare, and we are a company of organ regeneration platform technologies that's specializing in bioprinting and autologous therapy. And in Turkey, we have been very fortunate to be partnered with Biotrend Medical to offer state-of-the-art bioprinting technologies and knowledge sharing for the last two years. And today, um, I would like to tell you about the uh, benefits of bioprinting in the, context, in the context of today's mega trends and events in science and healthcare. And in this talk, I would also like to invite you to the world of ongoing applications of this technology in various fields. And we'll take a look inside the research labs in the commercial industries and even in the operating room. Now, before I talk about the field of bioprinting, I do want us to take a look around and see what's been happening in the news over the last two years. Because I think that these five events and megatrends get us closer to the values for which bioprinting is rising to attention today. So first off, September 2018, on BBC, we saw the feature news about a boy who was living for 14 years with the new bladder that was made from his own cells. And these were seeded with 3D inkjet machine into a decellularized pig skin as a scaffold. And this was a work done by the enterprising tissue engineering doctor named Dr. Anthony Atala, and many of you may already know him as one of the pioneers of bioprinting and tissue engineering. July 2019, 
one year from that news, we see the American Medical Association approving reimbursement codes for 3D printed surgical models and tools. Of course, this is not 3D bioprinting, we're talking about 3D printing, but what this enactment showed is that um, we're going to be using temporary codes that will be tracked for five years to see how 3D printing is valuable in hospitals. And although it will take us five years until full official reimbursement, these are making the foundation for a clinical registry of patient 3D scan data and relevant 3D modelings. And this will serve as learning resources and tutorials for an increasingly active implementation of 3D printing in biomedicine. And that is what we believe will also translate to 3D bioprinting of cells. September 2019, the US EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, becomes the first federal agency to, to make a strong statement about eliminating all mammal testing by 2035. And we are seeing this global transition to human research, humane research, and sort of expressing an urgency to find alternative solutions to animals for human research. And in October 2019, some of you may know, but Rocket Healthcare, uh, our company, and a diabetic foot ulcer specialty clinic in India, we put the bioprinter in the operating room. And we've created a streamlined process of skin regeneration for diabetic foot ulcers that basically makes use of bio inks made directly from, from patients' own adipose tissue. And these are printed into size specific patches and applied directly onto wounds. And Rocket Healthcare's mission here is to basically decrease and eliminate the rate of amputation for patients with DFU by early onset healing of these ulcers. And last but not least, in the most recent months of 2020, we've seen COVID-19 changing the way we are living, but most notably, we've seen the pandemic disrupt the traditional centralized value chain in manufacturing. When hospitals got cut off from supplies of masks or ventilators, because factories shut down, 3D printing came to the rescue to manufacture these supplies on demand and on site, right? So like what happens if we put all of these news together and what is the take home message for us in these global events and mega trends in biomedicine and healthcare? First, um, we believe that more and more hospitals will be using 3D printing now that it is reimbursed and it's a trend that could open doors to similar regulatory pushes toward 3D bioprinting of cells in the short future. As COVID-19 demonstrated, the ability for healthcare facilities to take on remote production and point of care manufacturing will significantly improve and grow in importance. And this is not true, perhaps just in you know, manufacturing that we know of, but perhaps it will be true in human tissue manufacturing for therapy. And so that's why attention is being paid to a biomedical technology like bioprinting that allows you to customize manufacture um, in tailor-made forms to the patient using his or her own cells. And you could provide services right by the bedside potentially. And finally, if we can use a technology that can fabricate on the human tissues, uh, why not use it in order to reduce the dependence on animal research? And so having said all of those, I think this is why I'm here today to talk about 3D bioprinting technology. And for all of these reasons above, it's worth paying attention to how this technology is, man is maturing to impact our research and healthcare workflows. So what exactly is 3D bioprinting? Many of you may already be familiar with it. It's the combination of 3D printing and biology. So bioprinting is the use of 3D printing technologies with cells, growth factors, and biomaterials to fabricate living structures that optimally and maximally imitate natural tissues. And similar to an inkjet printer, a bioprinter uses bio inks, which are basically made of hydrogels, 
from extracellular matrix components and cells, and then it lays them out in specific positions and layers and compartments that a living tissue may exist in. So we can think of it as the perfect harmony of computer science and biology. And the values that it brings are personalization and architectural complexity to human health applications. Now, the applications of bioprinting are numerous, but they can be categorized largely into three types, I think. One is the in vitro efficacy test model for toxicological testing and screening of novel products. These can be drugs, cosmetics, or even food. And as I show you here on the screen, this is an example of bioprinted skin, uh, the epidermis models for toxicological testings of cosmetics. An ideal study to evaluate the toxicity of a chemical or substance to humans would require an extremely large number of human subjects, as well as animals, who can represent the diversity of humans or in vivo, um, in vivo behaviors of tissues, but this would be unrealistic and unethical. So the use of human relevant models offer an alternative and a bridge between human clinical trials and animal studies with a standardized human tissue fabrication process that is also high throughput and you can specifically deposit test chemicals. A second application is the in vitro study model for human tissue physiology and disease modeling. This is a uh, cool picture from a science article that basically demonstrates how 3D tumors can be simulated as follows, as different blobs of colors. And these, each of these different colors basically demonstrate how heterogeneous each tumor tissue is. Traditional science has depended on 2D cell culture and 3D spheroids, but decades of research have shown that human tissues are hyper-complex and heterogeneous entities. And this is true not just structurally, but mechanically and biochemically. And cancer is definitely a prime example of such complexity. And bioprinting's ability to fabricate and visually map tissues in 3D gets us to the most accurate understanding of the human body. And this is true for, especially when we're discovering new uh, therapies for diseases in the human bodies. And finally, third type of applications is the in vivo model for transplantation and regeneration. Of course, one of the most common challenges in medicine is not having the sufficient number of tissues and organs to replace in the events of trauma or organ failures that come with aging. Flat structures like skin and tubular structures like blood vessels and urethras may be relatively simple to fabricate, but hollow non-tubular organs like bladders and pumping organs like the heart and lungs are very difficult to replicate. So for such highly complex organs, the bioprinting technology provides a, a, a kind of precision and complexity that human hands or existing manufacturing methods may not be able to match. And if these could be made with patients' own cells, the challenge of immune rejection and donor shortage of um, organ transplantation can be resolved once and for all. And that is the biggest promise of bioprinting. So here is an example of a uh, bioprinted heart patch that we can see is beating upon no, upon no uh, external stimuli. Now, if you can imagine that um, bioprinting facilities could be set up in every region of the world. And, and this technology has the potential to completely transform regional biomanufacturing value chains. And I talked about this when I talked about the COVID-19 in the beginning. And it's not surprising that in fact, bioprinting centers of excellence have been arising at the national and international level over the last five years. And these have been funded by 
uh, national governments to actually advance research of complex tissues and organs using this very technology. And so it's, a, it's worth noting that these trends are already happening and we are all in this movement together, right? So in the context of all of these, um, who is Rocket Healthcare? We are an organ regeneration platform company that's been contributing to the advancement of breakthrough science and healthcare using this technology. And we've been dedicated to providing um, over to 25 countries around the world and with over 250 user institutions and partners for this technology. So we've been um, leading the introduction of, in particular, state-of-the-art bioprinters called the Dr. In Vivo 4D. And the 4D was the world's first clean chamber bioprinter that basically showcases that we need to be able to print within an environment that can be kept sterile um, so that we are actually working with biological tissues um, that potentially have implantable uh, implantation capabilities. But 4D6 now introduced for the first time a completely integrated system. So not just the HEPA filter or germicidal UV lamps, but we have built in a cell incubator so that you're printing inside an environment that mammalian cell cultures would actually exist in, such as 37 degree temperature, 5% CO2, and 97% um, humidity level. And these are all equipped with six print pad biofabrications to take the tissue engineering projects to the next level of complexity. And we are also uh, providing materials like human cell derived um, ECM materials because we believe that in order to recapitulate human tissues, you need the entire environment, the environments of extracellular matrices instead of just one single component of them. So now let's get to the heart of the applications. And these range widely across fields of biomedicine. And from our experiences, these have ranged from material science and engineering to dental and craniofacial reconstruction, pharmaceutical formulations, and various fields of regenerative medicine of various tissues. And slides in the following are summaries of publications by actual uh, doctor in vivo users. So you can really get a grasp of how people, groups around the world are using the bioprinting technology to advance their projects. And for more details, all of these relevant articles can be accessed from the Rocket Healthcare homepage. So first and foremost, the hottest topic with bioprinting is, of course, the biomaterials research. And the reason is biomaterials are the engines of tissue engineering. And the technology of bioprinting has been playing a big role in characterization and development of novel materials. So in this study, a group at the Abo Academy in Finland, known for nature, you know, has developed a novel cellulose-based bioink that can be easily derived from wood. So UV, using UV cross-linking, this hydrogel can be made stiff so that the printed structure can withstand itself strong and robust and it can also be tuned by concentrations of ions so that it can accommodate different mechanical stiffness of native tissues and this group confirmed and tested this ink's ability to support various cell types from skin to pancreatic cancer cells another study from the daegu Gyeongbuk medical innovation foundation in korea um, we've demonstrated that you can also make use of natural materials like collagen, gelatin, alginate, and silk to fabricate living systems. And this is important because in the bioprinting field, people are also paying a lot of attention to discover bio inks that require no additional manipulations, such as UV light, temperature, or chemicals, um, with the hopes of minimizing damage to cells. So in this study, um, this group basically succeeded in using silk protein called serotonin, and they combined it with gelatin and glycerol to create a high precision scaffold with 200 to 500 micron core structures. 
Now this ink passes cytotoxicity tests with mouse cell lines. And the group demonstrates that because of serotonin's intrinsic properties that are anti-UV, antibacterial, and anti-inflammatory, you can potentially make use of this 3D bioprint to serotonin gel as a novel wound healing patch. Now, if cellulose and silk are all naturally derived materials using uh, bioprinting, um, a lot of groups actually make use of synthetic materials. Uh, they make their own by modifying existing materials because they often want to overcome any issues with printability and structural fidelity. So in this study by Hanyang University, a group developed a synthetic self-healing hydrogel called OHAGC-ADH. Um, not so important to know the different um, letters of this name, but the key thing is that they've modified forms of hyaluronate and kitesin. And the great thing about this hydrogel is that it forms bonds instantaneously without any postulation. And as you can see, the two colored discs that are separated, if you just put them aside next to each other, they bond instantly, self-heal, integrate completely at 10 minutes at room temperature. So what this group demonstrates is that if you can make use of this particular gel, um, you could also culture chondrocytes in 3D, in three dimensions. So they demonstrate in the data on the right that with this gel, you could support not only viability for the functionality of chondrocytes, which express SOX9 and markers of col collagen 2, which are all markers of chondrocyte and cartilage differentiation. So I've talked about the biomaterials research side of applications. Now, if we can you know, make better use of these hydrogels that can actually support themselves so that you are creating soft tissues in three dimensions, you open doors to various soft tissue engineering applications. So in this study by Seoul National University, um, this research group with Dr. Invivo sought out to engineer a novel way to regenerate adipose tissue. And as you know, um, this is a big uh, need in medicine too, in the event of trauma and especially, you know, post mastectomy with, um, uh, with breast cancer, for example. Now, conventional medical grade materials such as PCL are often used in breast reconstruction and nose reconstruction, but we all know that they don't match the mechanical property to adipose tissue. If, as you can see on the graph on the left, it's actually of a much higher compression modulus than adipose tissue. So this group first developed a novel biomaterial called PLCL, and they mixed it with adipose-derived ECM. And using the bioprinting technology, the group created a size-customized scaffold, which then can be implanted, which was then implanted onto mice, and they saw that it promoted adipose tissue regeneration in the form of macrophage infiltration and vascularization. So this group confirmed that bioprinting, combined with the new PLCL and ECM complex, can offer a new solution for burn, trauma injury, and post mastectomy repair, especially in large defects. And similarly, here, um, this group at Seoul National University developed a coding platform for growing functional salivary gland cells. And you can just pay attention to the, to the third image uh, in the figure of B. So this group basically created um, a 3D polycaprolactone scaffold, and on it, they coated it with hy hyaluronic acid-based uh, biomaterial that they developed. And then they seeded them with salivary gland cells. And as the chart shows below, this 3D scaffold-based um, 3D scaffold-based biofabrication of salivary gland tissue had a much higher budding level compared to the traditional uh, methods using agarose gels or uh, traditionally manufactured PC membranes. 
So the group um, basically demonstrates that with the bioprinting technology, you can apply this platform to create better human models for other branching epithelial organs. These behave in three dimensions um, by themselves. How do they respond to drugs or novel chemicals that we introduce to them? So here in this study by Wake Forest Regenerative Medicine in the U.S. combined with Jungang University in Korea, these users um, applied it to cancer therapy development. So they used um, cell lines of bladder cancer to create three-dimensional models. And then they compared these directly to 2D models, the traditional 2D cell culture, to evaluate the behavior of two types of cancer cell lines to two types of chemotherapies, which were rapamycin and BCG. And as could already be expected, the results of the chemotherapy tests did show very different profiles of reactions, regardless of the cancer cell lines. If you uh, saw them in 2D versus 3D. So the group concludes that using the 3D model of cancer is crucial to better assess a drug's efficacy. And in the same way, 3D bioprinted epidermis models have also been developed with Dr. In vivo, and these are used for humane and rapid toxicological screening. And these are done with layer by layer printing and maturation of keratinocytes. And as you can see in the histological pictures on the right above, these 3D printed epidermis layers have been characterized to show that they are multi layered and they show the micro layers that epidermis exists in. And immunohistochemistry results show that they, sh they, sh they show differentiation markers that keratinocytes grow through in each of the micro layers of the epidermis. And these are all 3D printed. And finally, functionally, these have passed the burial function tests and the irritation tests that are provided as guides by the OECD guidelines. So, so there's actually this whole set of guidelines published by the OECD which basically helps you to evaluate the efficacy of in vitro human tissue models. So you can take a look at those. And if you can um, basically test your epidermis models against those standards and pass the tests, then you can use them for your research moving forward. And last but not least, we see tissue engineering project going on for vascularized organs. Uh, perhaps at the level of highest complexity. Of course, we are far from, you know, printing whole voluminous organs with the entire vascular networks and all the different cell types. However, we are reaching the lower hanging fruit of creating a bioprinted um, part patches that can be used for localized um, healing if um, for example, if vascularization were, were to be cut off in certain portions of the heart. So in this study by Fraunhofer in Germany, the group created a linear pattern disc using alginate and IPSC differentiated cardiomyocytes. And they were able to demonstrate to create a cardiomyocyte patch that actually beats on its own. And in this study at the Politecnico di Torino in Italy, this group created a, something a little different. They created bioartificial scaffolds using PCL that is coated with the muscle-inspired approach and cultured with human cardiac fibroblasts. So as you can see, we're talking about you know, heart tissue applications, but we're using two different cell, cell types. Um, and in this project, what they were trying to do is not create an implantable heart patch, but they were trying to create uh, disease models, better disease models of the ischemic heart disease. And to, dif to represent the different stages of progression of ischemic heart disease, 
the group basically creates scaffolds with different porosities and irregularities of pattern because the resulting cultured tissue uh, would demonstrate different behaviors, uh, which is mimicking different stages of progression of the disease. Interestingly, bioprinting with Dr. Indivo has found application not just in human tissue and biomaterial research. Um, it has also found applications in customized fabrication of biointegrated devices or environmental filters. So left is the creation of an ergonomic bracelet using petrochemical TPE combined with nanocellulose. Right is the development of radioisotope adsorbents with easy porosity control and cheaper customized production. And these are for use in nuclear reactors, actually. So as you can see, there are diverse applications of bioprinting. And with the selective use of cell types, biomaterials, and 3D designs, you can really think that uh, the sky is the limit for imagination of applications of this technology. Now, in the last few slides, I will share with you clinical applications. And what that means is bioprinting has already entered the operating room to make real life changes in the benefits for the benefits of patients. Last year, um, with a biomaterial company, a, uh, actually a bone material company called BioRigin, took Dr. Invivo and they created an entire process in a GMP facility to produce customized bone implants, like the picture shown below in the far left corner. And the key thing here is that they actually took this entire process, this protocol, and got it approved by the Korean FDA. So the company can now produce um, these personalized customized bone scaffolds, and they can distribute them to hospitals. This, this is an excellent example of medical commercialization using bioprinting. This at a preclinical stage right now, but it is to have a clinical trial in Egypt for articular cartilage regeneration. And here we are uh, with Mass General Hospital, this, we, our group, Rocky Healthcare, is trying to address the challenge of um, stem cell or stem cell injection based methods of cartilage regeneration. As we all know, two of the key challenges in stem cell injection based models of cell therapy are that number one, these, you might need a large quantity of cells because they tend to spread out through the body um, because they, if they don't find that localization hotspot. And number two, even if they localize, they may die off eventually losing a large percentage of those cells that you injected. So how do we you know, take care of this problem? With 3D bioprinting, Imagine creating scaffolds like homes that can have the cells adhere to them through a specific coating of the biomaterials. And you insert these scaffolds laden with stem cells into the defect area, and they will stay there for a longer period of time, allowing the stem cells to uh, maximize their re regenerative potential at the defect site. So preclinical studies have been done in beagles, demonstrating um, successful regeneration of highline cartilage, which is the key thing for regenerative uh, cartilage tissue. And clinical trials are waiting for, uh, to be done in Egypt. And finally, I'm gonna come back to the DFU skin regeneration. So this is a model of chronic wound healing using bioprinting inside the operating room. And the idea is that the autologous adipose tissue, so I'm sure all of you are familiar with autologous adipose tissue harvests, and the autologous solutions that are filled in these adipose tissues are used as bio inks. 
and they're combined with a FDA approved ink that can gel on its own. Again, the concept of self-healing, self-gelling. And this patch can then be directly uh, applied to the, to the defect of chronic wound ulcers. And the result is a process something like this. And at Rocket Healthcare, we have shown that at the shortest in four weeks and at the longest in 10 weeks, we are seeing regeneration of chronic wound ulcers that have been remaining open for more than six months to two years. And we might say that that's common knowledge because we're using autologous solutions with the regenerative capacity and these are specific to the defect size. But this is a very encouraging result because over the last 20 years in diabetic with ulcer treatments, we haven't seen much uh, innovation happening outside of uh, dressings and negative pressure, uh, wound therapy, um, biologics, and et cetera. And if we can combine these therapies in a combination method, um, there is great uh, hope for the healing of chronic wounds. And here are the data from clinical trials. And this is a type of process that also harnesses the power of 3D scanning and printing uh, in C2. So in this project, um, there is the development of a portable 3D scanner that basically scans the DFU affected area. It visualizes and saves those data and they are uh, directly applied to the fabrication of these, uh, uh, of these regenerative patches. And of course, the bio ink is the patient's autologous solution. And then you apply it to the wound. So 3D scan print system. Um, this is perhaps the holy grail of in-hospital biomanufacturing with 3D bioprinting. And I prepared this video especially for us to demonstrate how it works. Um, and so in this 3D scan print system, this 3D, this, by the way, this is a model, uh, don't be afraid. Um, a 3D scanner basically scans the model, scans the foot, and it identifies the chronic wounds with the specific depth and sizes. Then it, it automatically generates data that can be translated into 3D models. And I'm just gonna fast forward a little bit just to show you what that looks like. And after wound measurements, it translates to scaffold printing that basically keeps the shape of the wound. And it proceeds to print with the bio inks and imagine these are autologous solutions. And then the patch would be directly applied to the patient's um, defect site. So this type of um, application is not just for diabetic foot ulcers, of course. You can imagine that this logic, this logic and the process can be applied to various human tissue regeneration and tissue engineering applications. Now, um, all of these are possible, of course, with the innovators and pioneers of bioprinting around the world that have really been actively pushing pushing the boundaries of bioprinting in various fields of science. And thanks to the feedback and the research re outcomes that we have been seeing with the first generation bioprinter, the Dr. In Vivo 4D, we are fortunate to this month actually introduce the next generation bioprinting system, which we no longer just call a bioprinter, we would like to call it the organ regenerator. The reason for this is we have an understood that the minimum requirements for organ regeneration can be summarized as these three requirements. And these are feedback from researchers and doctors around the world that we have worked with. Number one, the requirement is in C2 40 printing. The human body is a curved surface, as you can see in the chronic wound ulcer in diabetic foot ulcer patients. So the direct application of biomaterials to a curved surface of the body to create or repair living tissues should be easy. 
and that would allow us to actually use it in, in hospital. Number two, we should be able to treat all substances as potential infectious. So the bioprinting device should be able to sterilize itself as well as sterilize implantable devices that it creates. Number three, perhaps most critically, we should be able to print and take care of the printed tissues in their native conditions of cell environments. And these environments would include conditions of temperature, like 37 degrees, and in vivo pH dictated by CO2 levels and also humidity that also replicates what cells actually live in in the body. So with these three requirements, we imagine biofabrication, a cell incubator, and a sterilizer. And we have put all of those three in one device. And that is Dr. In Vivo 46. And this is what um, the title of my session um, really points to, not just this product, but the idea of an integrated biofabrication system. And so in this system, you have six print pads that are able to um, take the tissue engineering project to the next level of complexity. And as you can see below, retina, bone, muscle, and heart, they all exist in different macular, uh, dif different uh, macro patterns, right? So if you can accommodate all of these with different print pads, you are a step closer to human tissue engineering. Then you've got the incubator and sterilizer. By controlling the conditions at which the cells live in, you're not just talking about three-dimensional printing, you're talking about printing of cells in conditions that they live in. Sorry about that. Um, for high throughput applications, you need to be able to print in wells and this would be important, especially for in vitro mini organ development for drug testing. It would also be important for perhaps um, novel vaccine research, if you have to do it in a confined uh, chamber. And with high throughput applications like this, you could even streamline your research workflow to include PCR genotyping processes. Any of these repetitive processes why don't we replace with automated solutions? And of course, the different biomaterials that the biofabrication system can print really maximizes um, the level at which you can imagine human tissue engineering. So at the end of the day, uh, we have been trying to demonstrate in the last uh, minutes that due to the ability for bioprinters to have applications in medicine, Rocket Healthcare has really been trying to focus on the translation of the technology in the hospital. And so with these case studies in medicine, uh, we believe that the system can provide a fast track to medical usage and medical commercialization for those research groups who are trying to take that next step forward. And in the last few slides, I'll just uh, show a little video of how the soft, what the software looks like. It is provided in a tablet format so that you don't have to be restricted to your movements around the device. You can use a portable tablet or a mobile phone to control your hardware. And so at the end of the day, um, the take home message is bioprinting, it may sound, it may still be a novel technology, but it definitely is a more mature technology than we have seen before. And over the last several years, um, I think in PubMed, we see over 2000 journal articles with the key term of bioprinting. And people have been investing I, I think investing into the values that bioprinting brings to research and medicine. And these values include automation. These values include uh, better mimicry of biological systems. 
And this value includes um, in-hospital manufacturing with autologous solutions. So if you believe in those values, then I believe that bioprinting technology is something that we can all consider to improve or to advance the projects and the works that we are doing today. So with the cells and the bio inks and the 3D designs that we have in mind, bioprinting is really, if you simply think of it as a platform technology that allows us to get closer to the bedside point of care medicine strategies. And at the end of the day, today we live in an on-demand era where with the push of a finger, you can really get products and services delivered to your door. And I think um, bioprinting, I think this word may summarize what bioprinting brings for us in terms of values. Because you can on-demand manufacture human tissues for research and for perhaps transplantation, you have, the, you have control over your um, experimental results. You can have control over the design of the human tissues that you create, and you can have control over the quality that your outputs will bring. So with that said, I will conclude my presentation. Thank you so much for listening and I would like to open the floor for any question. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It's a fascinating talk and thank you very much. We learned a lot from you, Daya. Thank you, Daya. And there is a question Thank you. actually, uh, one of the questions is, how long does it take to print uh, the skin alike material? Yeah, um, many people, especially those that are interested in clinical applications always ask this, how long does it take? And the printing time I think is the most important uh, for us to get further deeper into the clinical applications. Now, really, it's a little hard for me to um, answer this question because the printing speed, printing time really depends on the size and the type of materials you're using. In the diabetic foot ulcer uh, clinical what, study what, that I showed. What is the biggest size, uh, size of the skin actually you can print? Yeah, so with our systems, the biggest size is 10, uh, 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by eight centimeters. Mm -hmm. So these are pretty big patches. And in the DFU clinical study, the printing time it took for us, of course, we don't go eight centimeters. We've gone to a few centimeters um, in height and up to 10 by 10 in width. It takes less than one hour. So we can complete the entire procedure in one hour. However, if we grow in sizes, if we grow in the number of complexities of materials, of course the printing time may increase. And our challenge will be to how to decrease that time. Oh, that's great. And uh, if you all, uh, I mean, if you have any questions, please write uh, on the chat box. I have another question actually. I, I saw a heart ischemia model. This was fascinating. I mean, I like it very much, but I just wanted to ask you whether, whether they use the cell line or primary cells there to establish. Oh, in the hard patch applications? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I showed two hard patch applications. One of them used the iPSC stem cells that have been differentiated into uh, cardio, cardiomyocytes. And then in the second one, they used primary cells, the cardio, uh, the cardiac fibroblasts. Uh, is, is the so, what is the passage number? Do you think is it uh, really matter? Um, so I'm not entirely sure about the passage numbers, but for primary cells, I think they minimize the passage uh, to be as closest to the initial patient biopsies as possible. For the iPSC stem cells, um, I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but I think it would follow the, the regular procedure that scientists take with those stem cells. Yeah, iPSC is also something very, main, very nice. I mean, we use for pluripotent stem cells. There's another yeah. question actually, it came out now with the food. Can you read the question actually on your chat box? 
or should I? Uh, oh, uh, let me see. Oh, yes, yes. Okay. With the foot ulcer, as the tissue damage might be deep, how do we ensure the viability of the bioprinting in the patient? Also, how is this tissue, how is this tissue maintained gas exchange and nutrients in the patient? Okay, um, good question. And at this point, I will clarify what the DFU clinical study um, model was. So first of all, we're not culturing any cells. Um, we're not culturing anything that has been taken from the patient. So we are just using these autologous solutions, which include stromal vascular fractions and the uh, concentrated ECM that are taken from adipose tissue and processed into bio inks. And we just directly print into a patch and apply. So there is no tissue damage uh, to the autologous solutions and they can just directly um, harness their potential as soon as they get implanted onto the diabetic foot ulcer. So it's not a bioprinted mature tissue that is getting um, implanted. It is a patch of autologous solutions that is getting implanted. And, and because we're not culturing anything, we're able to shorten the time that this procedure would take within one hour, which is what doctors uh, want to hear from us. Thank you very much. There is another question, actually. Yeah, do you, okay, do you want me to just answer them one by one? Yeah, please. This okay. is actually the last question, actually, if there is no more. Okay, so does it, I, I guess, does bioprinting mimic tumor microenvironments for modeling and targeting? Yes. And, and the theory is that, yes, not just for tumor microenvironments, but for any three-dimensional human tissues. So I was actually a researcher at the, uh, the cancer center at Koch, and one of the key things there was we were studying the interactions of Im different immune cell types with tumors. And in those tumors, uh, the different, uh, different types of uh, cell types existing within the tumors as well. And we had an ability to 3D image, you know, using confocal microscopy, for example, by sectioning the tissues that we see in, you know, for example, in mice models, but how can we fabricate these models and what technology is available to fabricate these tumor microenvironments? I think bioprinting is the only technology that gets at least closest to the architectural complexity that it exists in. So in the tumor, in the 3D tumor model that I showed you in one of our applications, no, it does not go far to you know, completely replicate the microenvironments. I think they just used um, they just they just used like two cell types of the cancer cell lines, and then they combined them in a hydrogel that has a uh, rich content of hyaluronic acid because that's what uh, many cancer microenvironments look like. But if you can go a step further from that if you can you know, position and output different, many different cell types and many different uh, biomaterials to make the model more complex. And it will just depend on your experiment design. Um, what uh, Ahmed asked, what is intradiscal solution and perineal solution? So can you, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with these terms. Can you clarify for me what these mean? And um, I will answer the questions right away. Um, I'll get back to this. Sally asked, what kind of ECM and bio inks are used in clinical applications? Good question. Um, clinical applications are different from research applications in that you are applying these biomaterials into the body. So you need to be ensured of their safety, um, toxicity, and the biocompatibility. So 
the bio inks that are used in these types of applications um, should already be FDA approved. So uh, there are not too many, but some biomaterials that are approved very well known are PCL, polycaprolactone. Um, it's used in surgery a lot already. Um, there are bio inks medical grade in collagen and uh, I believe gelatin. It can also be used. Um, there are also human, um, human cell derived ECM um, that can also be used for biomedical applications. And I think it's important to note that many commercial bio inks out there are individual components of ECM, you know, collagen, gelatin, alginate, um, et cetera. But we know that the ECM is actually a very complex matrix of its own. And it's not just a combination of different proteins, it's a combination of different signaling molecules, cytokines and, and fibers and et cetera. So Rocket, at Rocket Healthcare, we believe that it's important to have uh, ECM complete biomaterials for usage in clinical application, not just individual components. <clears throat> um, okay. Ekin asked, are there any studies on tubularized esophagus production? Um, yes, I have heard of studies using um, 3D printing to create tubular <clears throat> esophagus models. Um, I, I'm not aware of, you know, actual uh, doctor in vivo users who have done this, but if you are interested, I can definitely look up um, those publications and then send them to you. Um, because even if we're using different systems, um, I think the important thing is understanding the logic behind bioprinting these types of um, tissues or biological systems. Onur asked, do you use the system beside 3D tissue printing to cultivate cells? Yes, um, I tried to demonstrate this even for a little bit um, in one slide where I said bioprinting is not just for um, biological tissues, you can actually think outside the box and do food printing. You can do, um, you know, like I showed you, biomedical device printing and environmental filter printing, etc. The conventional 3D printing methods have relied on printing of, you know, hard materials, to say simply, and, and extrusion-based materials uh, with metal, for example, metal, uh, plastics, uh, etc. But the great thing about bioprinters is that they're equipped with syringe systems that can print hydrogels, like soft materials, gel materials. So that definitely opens up a lot of applications outside of the ones that traditional 3D printing could access. Um, Ahmed asked for, oh, I, I guess this question is, um, is, is, is an extension of the previous question. Um, what are interdiscal solutions, perennial solutions for annual So uh, because I'm not medically trained, I'm not really uh, aware of these terms to correctly answer the questions that you are asking. So if you can please leave me an email or leave, uh, uh, leave you know, the uh, host with an email with specific details of this question, I will definitely answer you within one day. I'm writing our email so they can write us. Yeah. And you can feel free free to CC us um, in the email address that you see in the screen too. Um, finally, what about the urethral tissues? Um, we don't have an application that I can show of urethral tissues, but it's one of those organs with tubular structures that um, I have yet to see in um, our user-based applications, but I am sure that we can find them 
in the bioprinting publications out there. Um, and if I go back all the way to the first slide, um, hold on just a second. If I go back all the way to the first slide where, um, Oh, here, not the first slide. If I go back here, um, these tables, maybe pay attention to these. I tried to compile tables of um, tables of publications that are basically, you know, that have basically identified ideal combinations of cell types and combinations of bio ink polymers at different concentrations for different tissue specific applications. And just like this, there is a there are tons of um, review papers that are combining these different um, combinations for uh, different tissues. And if we can find urethra related applications, I can definitely share them with you as well. Uh, if you leave your info in the email. If there is no, ah, there's another, <laughs> another question. Okay. Um, do you believe the tissues produced via bioprinter behave as much as autographs? I mean, the autograph by bioprinter can start the healing by its own. Um, I guess by autographs, you mean um, uh, grafts of the skin taken from the patient, right? Um, I think at the end of the day, I think by themselves, autographs are definitely effective uh, methods because they basically have the entire, um, let's just talk about skin. They have the entire skin structures and the biochemical signalings that exist in the normal living tissues themselves. However, the challenge with autographs is that you have to make another wound in the body. And especially with uh, patients of, you know, body-wide burns, for example, or trauma that does not allow us to take an autograph of skin, then we would definitely need an alternative method that is less invasive. And so in this front, bioprinting gives a promise of, of novel skin regeneration solutions and novel tissue regeneration solutions. I'm not... On, Onur asked, I'm not familiar with printing methodology, but wonder about the medium, which the machine used to cultivate cells, especially in tumor cells. Uh, we do not have an appropriate medium for all. Um, in terms of media, researchers uh, choose their own. They, they typically use the media that they have been using before. Um, bioprinting, doesn't change the choice of media that you end up using because it's just translating the manufacturing method um, and it's not really changing the type perhaps the types of cells and the environments you've been using before you adopted the bioprinting technology so media i think will depend on the choice of the researchers based on their knowledge um, in their research but um, the key, the important thing would be is that when you're printing cells encapsulated in hydrogels, you do print them in structures that have pores, porosities, so that the media can flow through the structures to reach um, different corners of the structure, different, uh, different corners of the structure to deliver all the nutrients that come from the media as well as the oxygen. So um, yeah, 3D printed structures of tissues should have the same access to media as 2D cell culture, and e even better actually. Can this meeting uh, and the presentation file be shared with the participants? Um, yes, uh, with the exception of just a few slides um, after I I asked my boss, but I'm definitely happy to share the presentation file for your uh, knowledge. Yeah, please send me the slides so I can send them. 
Is that okay? Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. And I guess I don't want to uh, hold you guys too long, but uh, Dr. Metin, you can decide. Um, does it have to be autologous in clinical practice? This, uh, this the, is the last question. Let's make it, I mean, uh, because it's already late in Korea. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> and this, this will be our last question, okay? Okay. Um, does it have to be autologous in clinical practice? Um, the, I think the biggest promise of bioprinting comes from the ability to use autologous cells in the bioprinting systems to create you know, an output that is made up wholly of the patient's own cells. I think it's the biggest promise, but um, does it have to be autologous? No. If you find, you know, if I'm sure there are research groups who have found ways and they are already practicing um, research in creating mature human tissues or mature human um, organs with autologous solutions or, or non-autologous solutions with, you know, maybe stem cells from cell banks and then creating these organs and applying it to practice. I think it's just a matter of um, whether you're able to go to the next step of regulatory approval. Uh, once you go into cell culturing and not using autologous solutions, there's definitely a lot more regulatory uh, guidelines you have to abide by. Um, because these are not uh, of your own cells or solutions. But um, there are two open doors. So I, I do look forward to how bioprinting develops to make use of both of those um, solutions for better tissue engineering and organ regeneration. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much Thank you for much, active Gabriel. feedback. Thank you. And as you see, there are many questions and we would like to see you again actually here, okay? Uh, I would be happy to be welcomed. And again. I would uh, thank to everyone for participating. But before closing, I would like to announce our other uh, talk, which will take place on July twenty uh, second. I sent already the flyer on the chat box. You can find the flyer, and I hope to see all there as well. And thank you, Daya, again, and thank you everyone for participating and. Have a good night. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Bye.